for a little while. Amen. The ark is almost ready. Amen. How about we come to two places in your Bible just to start with 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 and 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and before you <clears throat> immediately feel like you know where the message is going let me at least give you a title you live in a day and time where the variety of food is everywhere you can pretty much go to a whole different plethora of restaurants and find pretty much anything you like and find it how you like it to be done. I mean, there's a lot of fish houses, but certain ones have better hush puppies than the other ones. They put a little sugar in there with it. And you can go to other restaurants that have a pretty good sized menu, but their bread is like, not the best bread, kind of like eating cardboard, chewing on a bed sheet, something like that. And then you pick another restaurant, they have the variety of the menu, but they got really good bread. And bread's free. Unless you're on keto, and then it's like crack. And you got to have a fix. And sometimes you just want a good hamburger. And sometimes you need a good steak. My question to you today would be this, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope you'll bear with me and allow me the time to sort of give you some things to ponder and think about, but my question would be is, not just where are you eating, but who are you eating with? Uh, amen. You say, why? Because in the Bible, the Lord has a certain table, and He feeds His sheep from that table. Goat food's not in the table. And all the other animals, not at that table, just sheep food at the table. This doesn't even have to do with just the church that you go to. This has to do with a multitude of things because oftentimes we can be seated at the same table, but we can be in a far country. So would you just let me kind of give you a couple of verses here. Look, if you will, please, first of all, it's very difficult for me to be at two restaurants at the same time, though I may desire to be that way. I might be down here at the Sino Cat when somebody texts me from a steakhouse and I'm thinking I'd rather have this from that and that from this, but I can't be both places at one time. So the Lord says this in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. He says in verse number 12, He said, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. No temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak to, as to wise men, judge what you say. The cup of blessing which we bless is not communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they that which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that idol is anything, or that which is offered and sacrificed to idols is, it, is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God, and I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. And you cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table with devils. Brother Larry, you pray, would you please? My Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we're grateful to be here, Lord, physically this morning. Health-wise, able to be here. God, I thank you for Brother Isaiah and his wife here and the healing that took place there. But, Lord, we ask you, Lord, that you might be with our preacher this morning. 
the words that will come forth from him. And though we're here physically, I pray we make preparation this morning spiritually for God to hear the word. Help our hearts this morning. Clear our minds for a, for a spell, Lord, that we might be able to be focused on you as we were taught in the first hour. Uh, God, that our eyes uh, physically, uh, God, might be directed and focused toward, towards you, Lord, but more so spiritually, our hearts. We need your help this morning. We've, we've come through a week, Lord, uh, in the world. We've worked the best we could. We've done what we could. And, Lord, our footsteps, we try to keep our journey in the middle of the road in our path the best we can with your help. But, Lord, we're fed spiritually from your house on Sunday morning. We're fed from your preacher over the pulpit on Sunday morning and Wednesday evening. And we ask for that help this evening, I mean this morning. I thank you, Lord, for what you give us. But we realize fully we need your spirit, your blessing on the word uh, to our hearts this morning. Give us that, Lord, if you will. We ask you for it, and we give you the glory in advance for what you do for us. Be with your man now. Rest upon him. Breathe upon the word as it comes forth. We need it, Lord. We need it as much as we need breath uh, to survive. Yes. We give you all the glory now for what you're going to do for us. Thank you for our visitors. Thank you for those that are listening uh, through the airways, Lord, especially the ones that would be here if they could, but can't. And then those that are tuning in around the world. Uh, really, in Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 Thank you. You can be seated. Let me say this to you. It's not just about what you eat, but who you eat with. There's an old saying that you are what you eat. Now, I found that to be true. I found out that if you put the garbage in, then we have a tendency to have garbage come out. And I've heard over a period of time that oftentimes people will blame the computer for whatever the problem is. But the fact of the matter is a human being programmed the computer. And sometimes the glitches in the computer are not an electronic thing. They happen to be the fact that they were programmed wrong to begin with. And so oftentimes when we come to the Bible, we accept the fact that, well, there are certain things we should do and certain things we shouldn't do. But here's what can happen. Over a period of time, the complacency of not paying attention to what's going in can get us accustomed to eating things that we probably shouldn't eat. And then before long, you develop allergies or you develop sicknesses or whatever it might be. And you go to the doctor and the doctor tests you and he finds out, wow, you got all kind of problems with your blood work. It's all whacked out and it's not just menopause or it's not just some going through a change or whatever. You've actually got some problems because of your dietary practices. You've been eating the wrong foods for far long. Oh, I've been eating these things, some will say, all my life. Yeah, but as you get older, the things that you used to be accustomed to that your body could handle uh, out of ignorance or whatever because you were more active and a lot more things were going on, your body was able to process those things. And now that you've gotten older, those things have a tendency to get hung up and sometimes they get hung up right around the middle and sometimes on the place where we sit. And sometimes the thighs that move us. Yeah. Rarely ever is it placed where we want it to be. It's usually placed somewhere we don't like it to be. Right. Right. And so the Lord tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, He says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now watch, for what fellowship hath Christ with Belial, and what fellowship hath light with darkness? Wherefore I say unto you, come out from them, and be ye separate, and touch not the unclean thing. We all understand that, but what can happen over a period of time is, is that we can be hammered by the world so much that unbeknownst to us, we can be like a first illustration would be in 1 Kings chapter number 18, when there's a lady there by Jezebel who happens to be Ahab's wife. The king of the then known world at that time, King Ahab was there and he had been told it's not going to rain anymore. And amazingly what happens during that period of time of stress and trouble and trials and difficulty, the nation of Israel is being judged. You all know the story. There's a famine in the land. There is no rain that is falling and everyone is starving to death. Yet there still seems to be the people that are in charge of are prophets with are now seated, 1 Kings 18, at Jezebel's table. 
Why? Well, after a period of time, they kind of got worn down. And, and before long, you know, it's kind of like, well, you know, everybody else does it. And well, I mean, I don't really see a problem with it. And well, I mean, you know, you got to do what you got to do to be able to survive. And before long, you do understand Jezebel is like an antichrist is. I mean, the Bible even mentions her in the book of Revelation and talking about people that are in cahoots with her. And he tells you in the book of Revelation, those in the tribulation, get out of the bed with her because she is bad news bears. But interesting, the leader, interestingly enough, the leadership of the nation of Israel had begun to sort of drop their guard and they had begun to kind of dis, the, get away from the old ways and get away from the old paths and get away from the, you know, the, the, the unmodernistic things that the Lord required the nation of Israel to do. And they started picking up on their forms of worship and they started, you know, going to church with them and going to their worship services with them because their altar was still very much in intact and so their services were continuing on a regular basis so much so that now guess what happens the first thing that happens when Elijah shows up is is he said what are the God's prophets doing seated at the table with Jezebel's prophets who are you sitting with today are you sitting at Jezebel's table? Have you adopted the worldly theology, the worldly ideas, the worldly ways of doing things? I mean, things that you used to as little as maybe three or three and a half years ago before the famine, before the drought, before the, the rain had stopped, before the animals were starving and the children were dying and those kind of things. I mean, you know, the things that you would never dare even think about doing. And now all of a sudden it's like, well, I don't really know that it's that big of a deal. And I don't really see the problem. And I mean, I can't tell that the judgment is on me. And so guess what? You know, I'm kind of trying to get them in and trying to win them and I'm trying to be a part of them. Can I just say this to you? That sometimes the conversation around Jezebel's table will lead to compromise. And before long, you'll be sitting there having a meal. Can I say this to you? A meal is intimate. When you're eating with somebody, I mean, that's something that sustains life. And generally speaking, and the younger women in here will know that you'll remember, and the elder ones too, that before you got married, that eventually it progressed from having coffee to let's have a meal. That means that when you say meal, that's like we're having a day. I don't care if it's Chick-fil-A in the parking lot eating waffle fries. It's still a meal together. It produces an intimacy. And then the next thing you know, because you're eating together, it's kind of like you begin to adopt because eating in cakes that there's some time spent. And before long, the conversation begins to turn. And then guess what happened? In that case, the entire nation of Israel compromised. I think it started at the dinner table. I think what happened is, is after a while, you know what they said? These guys are not so bad. I mean, I mean, look, I know they're a little bit different than we are, but I mean, they sacrifice like we do. It's kind of the same God. They call him Baal. We call him God. I mean, you know, tomato, tomato. I just, preacher, that, that's kind of getting a little carried away. Yeah, but then the next thing you know, you'll start noticing some things will start to slip because before long, they'll be attacking the Bible, you believe. Yeah. And the doctrine that you hold dear to but what happens is, is now your emotions get involved. And then before long, you know what you do? You do what you say you'd never do. You're sitting at the table with them and you're listening to them as they change your ideas and you begin to compromise. And what used to not be right, now it's like, nah, I don't really think there's anything wrong with it. And the music slips just a tad and the movie slipped just a tad. And the dress slips just a tad and the attendance a tad. And, and then the next thing you know, it's kind of like, well, where are they? Oh, they're sitting at Jezebel's tail. They're down at the church of the numbers. Jezebel's tail. They're down at the church of the numbers. I mean, they, 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 I mean, they, 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 they getting it, man. They having smoke and mirrors, man, and guitars and stuff. And they're singing and having a hoot and nanny and the singing so loud you can't even hear the, I mean, the music so loud. You can't even hear the singer. You say, well, what happened to them? They're sitting down at Jezebel's table. 
I don't know where you're sitting this morning, but I do know this. The Bible does teach us in the last days. The Bible tells you clearly that many will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, and many shall depart from the faith. I think a lot of those individuals wind up going to Jezebel's table, and they wind up sitting down. I wish I had time to go through all of my illustrations to simply tell you how many things have been done over a meal that have led to the demise of humanity. In the name of sitting down at a meal, wars have been started. And plagues have been decided upon. I think also about Malachi where he said they snuffed at, they made fun of, they laughed at the Lord's table. There's no way you can sit at Jezebel's table and not make fun of the Lord's table. Remember our text when we started, you can't sit at the Lord's table and the table of the devil. Well, one or the other has to be. You'll either cling to the one and despise the other or hate the one. And, and I can't remember which one it goes there, but love the one and hate the other, despise the one and cling to the other. I got it backwards, but you understand what I'm saying. In other words, you can't be in two places at one time. One of the greatest things that leads to the demise of many Christians is, is we get very comfortable, complacent at Jezebel's table and then we compromise and before long the constant pounding, the constant pounding, the constant pounding, the constant pounding, then all of a sudden you know what you say? I can't take it anymore so you just capitulate. You just say, okay, look, whatever, that's fine because I'm just enjoying having it. Can I tell you how many young girls and boys that I have seen destroyed when they met the person of their dreams and after a while the stuff that they were raised with and taught and learned at the feet of Jesus all of a sudden it's like well I don't really think that's that big of a deal anymore and it all goes right out the window. You say, why well, they decided that it's Jezebel's table's not so bad. It's just kind of one of, of compromise. I mean preacher after all it's peace at any cost, right? No, it's not but oftentimes we make it that way. Can I say this? Maybe you're at the table with Saul this morning. What's Saul's table? Well, I, I use that one as an illustration that he had invited David in 1 Samuel 18 and, and 1 Samuel chapter number 19. He'd invited David to come over and sit there. As a matter of fact, a little bit later on in the passage, you find out that Saul asked Jonathan, where's David? And he said he had a meeting that he had to go to, Dad. He wasn't able to get here. And now Saul actually gets mad at his own son and tries to stick his son to the wall. I mean, tries to pin him to the wall with a javelin. David on two occasions has come there to play the harp to try to soothe Saul. But Saul is so convinced that there is a conspiracy against him that somebody is out to get him. He thinks that David is the one that is after him. And so as a result of that, guess what winds up happening? He says, you know something? I'm out to get whoever is after to get me. And now that table doesn't become one of compromise. It becomes one of conflict. And then before long, guess what happens? Every time somebody comes, the topic of conversation is, where's David? Why isn't David here? Jonathan says, listen, we're going to have a big family reunion and we would like for you to be there. And David said, ah, the Lord didn't give me the liberty to be there. I don't have any business. Listen, he already tried to pin me to the chair on two other occasions. I'm not going to be coming. And David saw, um, Jonathan says, one of those three, <laughs> Jonathan says, he said, listen, your seat will be vacant and you will be short, sorely missed. David said, well, if you feel that way, I feel guilty. I'm going to go ahead and come sit at the table. That's not how it goes. David said, you'll just have to miss me being absent from the table. Yes. But how often is it that we sit at a table and before long that table turns to a table of conflict and it's not even about you, it's about somebody you know. Somebody that they don't like and they're trying to sort of, in a sense, reel you in to get you to understand, hey, you need to listen to me and you need to talk to me and hey, I don't like them and if you're going to eat with me, you shouldn't like them. And then before long, javelins are coming out. I don't know about you, but I hear enough things 
because of what I do and some of the things because of what I've done, I hear enough conflict as it is than to go to have dinner and the entire dinner is about somebody that, that I need to get on board with and I need to attack because they're attacking them. That's a great way to ruin a good meal. You get pulled into the meal and you know what? The next thing you know, it's all of a sudden, well, this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened. And what are you going to say? Especially if they're picking up the cheek, they don't check, they don't have alligator arms. Now all of a sudden you become complicit. You become a part of that particular argument. And guess what? By you not saying anything, it looks like you're in agreement with what they're saying. And you didn't intend to be, but now you become a part of that conversation by not simply saying, hey, I don't agree and I don't want to hear it because you didn't say anything. They're like, oh, he's complicit. He agrees with me. And then here's how that'll go. Oh, well, I talked to the preacher the other day about this. And then they lay it out as if the preacher was complicit in the statement and the preacher just sat there. But because the idea was to create conflict... And to cause, excuse me, the wrong kind of companionship. And then all of a sudden, guess what winds up happening? There's conflict and then you get drawn into a conflict. And you're like, how did I get here? Because you sat at the wrong table with the wrong people discussing the wrong thing. Can I say this to you, ladies and gentlemen? It's not a sin to say no. Maybe I should say that again. It's not a sin to say no. Sometimes we have to learn that there's boundaries. It's not good to eat with everybody. As the Apostle Paul comes along there and he gives you some ideas about the brethren, he said, if they're doing this and they're doing this and they're doing this and they're doing this, with such a one, no, not to eat. You know why? Because eating with them looks like you're complicit in what they're doing. Well, preacher, I'm just trying to rehab them. I'm just trying to help them. I'm just trying to be a blessing to them. It's interesting to me how many people are in the rehab business. It's interesting to me that of the ones in the rehab business, they're never sitting with the right people at the table. There's always somebody questionable at the table. Amen. And so all of a sudden you begin to wonder, well, you must be in the rehab business. Well, it's what the Lord did. But none of them ever come to church with them, but they're always in the rehab business. It's like, I think they're more comfortable with the people that create conflict because they are conflicted themselves and thereby, guess what? I believe birds of a feather flock together. And the next thing you know, you go sit down with somebody to have a meal, which is intimate and you should be enjoying it. And before long, you feel like you're going to throw up in your mouth and you got heartburn and you're thinking, what am I doing here? And now you're in a position where your stomach is knotted up and you're thinking, man, I can't even shove bread down my throat because I'm feeling like I need to say something like, hey, I'm telling you now, I don't know the whole story, don't want to know the whole story, but don't include me in your conflict. Amen. Amen. All they're trying to do, you'll feel it pretty quickly, is Saul is trying to, because he's the king, he's trying to rope everybody at his table into, y'all are in agreement with me, aren't you? That David is the devil, and David is the problem, and David is trying to take my son away, and David is trying to take over the kingdom, and David is doing this stuff, and everybody's sitting at the table. I mean, he's the king. What are they going to say? Amen. You know what David said? I'm not sitting at that table. Yes. Amen. Amen. The Lord told me I don't have to be there. Is it preacher? So you're just talking about basic separation. Though this is far beyond basic separation. <laughs> this has a whole lot more to do with uh, not just where you're going at night when you shouldn't be going to places at night. This has to do with where you're having companionship, where you're having uh, that idea where compromise can work in. And then guess what will happen? That conspiracy begins to develop at the table. Do you remember Herod in the New Testament? You surely remember Herod in the New Testament. Had a wife by the name of Herodias. Right? That's his name with her last the little uh, a suffix on the end of that thing. And that's there in, in that particular part of the passage there. And so she's sitting there at the table and they begin to discuss some things. And her and her daughter sit down and they start a conspiracy. And she says to him this, she, or to her, she says, listen, honey, uh, when, when the king gets in here, we're going to have a special party for him. It's his birthday. We're going to throw a big party. And uh, I'd like for you, she's like a, a pimp ass. She said, I'd like for you to dance for your stepdaddy. Yeah. Come on. Mm -hmm. 
Enough said there. And when he gets to a point, I want you to stop. The Bible said that she danced for him and all those seated at his table. There wasn't no private dance going on in the back room of the club. Although publicly, mama put her daughter out there. And she said, here's what you're to ask for. Hey, mama, this is a chance to hit the lotto. I mean, we can be set for life. We can lay up a retirement account. I mean, what you want me to ask for? Bentley and a new house out on the Mediterranean? I mean, how would you have it to be? She said, no, don't ask for any of that. You ask for the head of that preacher. He's been disturbing our table for far too long. I can't sit down and have a meeting with your daddy without that preacher's name coming up all the time. I'm wore out with him. I figure if I cut off his head, it'll stop his mouth. And guess what happened? The conspiracies hatched. You say, where? At the table. You say, well, what kind of conspiracy? A conspiracy to kill the preacher. Would you agree, wrong table to be seated at? Would you agree that oftentimes, can I say this as gently as possible, sometimes as parents, we involve our kids in a conspiracy to get one of our enemies and we don't care the cost to them as long as we're able to get done what we want done. Give me the head of that John the Baptist. Sometimes seated at the table, it produces the conversation that not only causes conflict and the conspiracy, but oftentimes you find in the Bible tables that produce a great amount of charity. There's a woman in the Bible over there in the book of 2 Kings. She's called a great woman of Shunem. Not really much said about her. Don't know what her name is, but you know what we do know about her? She's walking out one day and she said, you know, that preacher comes by here on a regular basis. She said, I was thinking, we got a little extra room up there. Let's turn it into an Airbnb for the preacher. Let's put a bed in there. Let's put a table in there. And let's put a candlestick there. You say, what kind of table is that? A charitable one. It seems to be so minute. It doesn't really seem to be a big deal, but the preacher didn't have a place to stay. Where would the candle sit if it didn't have a table to sit upon? Where would he place his Bible, his scrolls, or, or his other stuff if there wasn't a table to be able to put it there? A table seems to be so infinitesimally small, insignificant in and of itself, and yet a table, we call this the Lord's Supper table, a table can be great comfort to individuals, although it seems to be so small. It can hold the things that create and produce the light that shines in a dark place. I'm sure that preacher could have walked in there in the dark. He didn't have a phone to flip over and hit the flashlight button and to be able to shine the thing and so on and so forth. I'm sure there were no flashlights in those days and no torches. I'm sure he could go up the stairway to that place. I bet you what he appreciated is the fact when she knew he was coming, you know what she'd do? She'd walk over to that table. Well, that was just evening time when the lights are beginning to the dim out and the sun's beginning to go down. And she says, well, you know, the preacher would be here after a while. Lights that candle right there. That way the preacher won't stumble and fall and break his neck when he comes in. And I bet you, you know what? There's something about a candle sitting on a table that gives a room warmth. Makes somebody feel welcome. Because there's light that's involved in that. What is that? Sometimes at a table you can find something that's charitable. Sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, we miss great opportunities to just show charity to other people because we won't take time around the table. If you're going to sit around a table, it's going to take a little time. It doesn't just happen overnight. All kind of tables in the Bible. There's obviously the table of showbread where the candle lights are there and where the showbread is there and those kind of things. But you obviously know what all those things are. But I'm going to ask you, and this is all just introduction to you, I wonder sometimes if you thought, thought about even for a moment that the Bible said they were seated at the table at Simon the leopard's house. 
Simon the leper is a man who's known because of his disease. But did you know this also in John chapter number 13? That the Bible says that the Lord arises from the table. And you know what he does? He washes the disciples' feet. You realize that sometimes the dinner table, the supper table that's provided for you is a place of being able to cool off and get some comfort. I got a picture somebody gave me a long, long time ago and a picture I had seen in an old preacher's uh, uh, library somewhere. I don't even remember where I saw it, but I described it. And it had a preacher over in the corner. He was old and well-worn in years. His Bible was real worn in years, obviously been around for a while. And he'd obviously gone through something that had occurred there at the church and was having a difficult time with it. And he had his glasses pushed back up on the top of his bald head there. And he's sitting there and his tie is disheveled. And you can tell he's just literally worn out and exhausted. And if you look at the bottom of that picture, you see Jesus down there with a bucket of water and you see him holding on to that preacher's feet and he's pulled off one of his shoes and he's washing his feet. You say, where'd that happen? It happened at a supper. Because sometimes the compatibility that takes place instead of the confrontation that takes place at a table is something that will cement you together for life. You say, why? Because you remember when the Lord got up from there, He said, by this, they'll know you're my disciples, that you love one of this. You've seen me do this, now do it yes. to each other. We're not talking here about literal foot washing, but can I say this to you? How many times have you been worn out with life and trouble and problems and difficulties and you sat down and the Lord said, give me your feet. Yeah. And how quick we are to say, Lord, you don't need to wash my feet. Lord said, I just want to cool you off a little bit. I don't know if you ever had a good foot washing. I mean, by the right people, the right time, the right way. I mean, where they get out the soap suds and the little brush and they scrub your little tootsies and they turn them from black to pink, you know, and all of a sudden the skin gets loose and then they get them all trimmed up and fixed up and all that because you have toes that look, toenails look like Nebuchadnezzar's claws. <laughs> that happens when you get old. And you get old all of a sudden, the things that we take for granted, I mean, anybody in here could go. Some of you do it while you're in church. I wouldn't recommend that. Sometimes uh, the people that are cleaning the church are like, man, who in the world is clipping their toenails in here? <laughs> I'm not kidding you. And if you're doing that now, I got an answer for you. Stop it. <laughs> this ain't the place to cut your stinking toe jammed feet. Thank you, preacher. I appreciate that. You say, oh no, that, oh yeah, we've had it on more than one occasion. Different places, so it's different people. That's the scary thing. Toe jam ain't good. You can't put it on toast. But you do know what I know. I, I know this, that sometimes when your feet are tired and worn out, and you go sit down by a creek, and you take your shoes off, or you sit down by this edge of a swimming pool, and you dangle your feet in the water. There's something that has a cooling, comforting effect about that. Amen. And it has a tendency to affect you all over. I wonder whether or not maybe you're seated at Jesus' table today and realize, you know something? I need to have the Lord cleanse me and clean me and comfort me. Maybe I've done some things that I shouldn't do. And the Lord says, hey, Peter, give me your feet. You know, one of those suppers that while they're all sitting there eating, one of the greatest events in the entire Bible happened at a table. The disciples are sitting there and they're just enjoying a meal. It's going to be the last one. They don't realize it. And all of a sudden, Mary comes in. You know the story. And she walks in. She's got an alabaster box, all of a sudden, full of uh, costly ointment. And she comes down there, interrupts the men's meeting, and comes in there. And at the table, while Jesus is at the table, she comes in there and she breaks that box over Jesus. And you know what happens? That entire thing that happened at the table, the Lord said, Let this be a memorial unto her. She hath done what she could. We're at, at the table. Would you agree with me that that was probably a, a pretty unusual thing? But if it's the Lord's table, sometimes the Lord's table requires confession, doesn't it? First Corinthians chapter number 11, I'm coming to my last two points and they'll take a couple minutes. Long, short sermon, but long points. In First Corinthians chapter number 11, you know what he says to you? He says, listen, before you eat this, 
bread and you drink this cup in remembrance of me, let's do a little internal investigation. And that's not a bunch of guys who work in an office that's separate down the road that they come in and pull your stuff out and they're investigating you. That's you investigating yourself with the Holy Spirit. You say what? Before you eat. Before you partake of this. What do I need to do? Lord, I want to sit at the table with you. Okay, here's all you need to do. I need to wash your feet. But now before I wash your feet, I'm going to ask you a question. You got a problem? Well, what do you mean, Lord? Well, if you judge yourself, you'll not be judged. If you don't judge yourself and you act like there's nothing wrong with you and you eat and drink unworthily, you're going to eat and drink damnation to yourself. This calls many are weak and many sickly and many asleep. They're dead. Sometimes a table can be a come to Jesus meeting. I like the, the passage over in John chapter 21. He gets to the very end of the thing there and they're all up there getting ready to eat before he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? He comes down through that passage. You know what he says? He's got the fish there and he's got the barley loaves there and he's got it ready. You know what he says to him? Come and dine. You know what the Lord would love to do? The Lord would love to have you to sit down at the dinner table with him, but you can't come to the dinner table dirty. You say, what do I have to do? I have to come to the dinner table and confess so I can get clean and then I can have fellowship. Sometimes the dinner table is a great place. I can't tell you how many times my dad would sit there and look at me and I knew he would always wait until after lunch. That is a great way to ruin your lunch. If I cut up on a Sunday morning service, if I got up early, I was zipping up my Bible, I was putting on my coat, I was talking during the invitation or whatever. After the service was over with, I could tell by how my dad was acting, what was coming. And we'd get in the car and I'd say, hey, daddy, he'd say, I'll talk to you when I get home, boy. <sighs> so then to get ready and the mama calls everybody to the dinner table. I'm like, daddy, can I? I'll talk to you after lunch, boy. How much lunch do you think I'm going to eat? I figure, man, if he whoops me, I'm going to wind up throwing up, so I'm just not going to eat, you know. And so you sit there and pick around like that, and then he's like, uh, Daddy, can I, kid, I'll talk to you when I get up from my nap, boy. My goodness, I mean, just waiting and waiting and waiting. You know what I know? I know in those times when I'm sitting at that table, I love my daddy and my daddy loves me. But you know what I know? Uh, there is such a controversy between the two of us that there's literal conflict going on and I can't get any peace and I don't want to eat anything because I got problems with the, someone sitting at the table. Do you know that people sometimes come to this church and they can't eat what God puts in the trough because they've got a problem with somebody sitting at the table? They say, old preacher, that would never happen. Some of you sitting here listening to me know I'm telling you the exact truth. You have a problem with somebody here and guess what? No matter what the Lord throws out there, you're not eating. You say, why? Because I've got a problem with somebody sitting at the table. Let me give you just a couple more things here. I hope it's making sense to you. I, I don't know about you, but I'd like to be at the master's table. You say, why? Remember the woman over there in Matthew uh, 15? Remember when she comes up there, she approaches the Lord and the Lord, she's a Syrophoenician woman. She doesn't have a name there. And she says, my daughter is sorely vexed. She's possessed of the devil. She's coming on the behalf of somebody else. She's not even coming for herself. It's strange to me because in that passage, the Lord brings something up there through that woman. And he calls her a dog. First he says, it's not fit for me to feed you stuff that belongs to somebody else. That's a modern version of that. I'm not giving you food that's for the Jews. You're a misfit. You don't get to eat. You want to get in? You've got to get in through them. You know what the woman says? Okay. And he says, besides that, you ain't nothing but a dog. Now, come on, ladies. Honestly, you've gone to him on the behalf of your daughter. Your motive is pure and clean and right, and you're believing he can change what the situation is with your daughter. There is no ill-gotten motive in your heart. And he says to you, you're a dog. I'm not 
going to cast the bread to a dog. That's your answer? You know what her answer is? I'm leaving the church. I'm out of here. I don't know who he thinks he is. You know what he said? You know what she said? Truth, Lord. But Even the dogs get the crumbs which fall from the masters. What are we talking about today? You ever been to a nice? I know you have. You're too. You're 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 rolling in the dough. You ever been to a really nice restaurant? I'm talking about one of those that when they first serve you your first course, which is like bread or crackers or whatever, after they're done with that, because we're Americans and we're slobs and we get it everywhere, then they come along and they got this little scooper. And they come up there and they're all, you know, just up, excuse me, just a moment. And they take up the plate and then they, they scoop up those crumbs. And sometimes they forget to put the plate there and do it. And it's like, and they do it, and then it's like, oh, man, I just dumped all the crumbs on the floor. That's why they come along with the thing right while you're eating. <laughs> right? That's what she's talking about. Yes, Lord, you're right. Truth. But you know something? Even I get the crumbs which fall from the master's table. You're the master. I don't deserve to be sitting up there with you. I'm not asking to sit with you. I'm asking for a crumb. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And if there's power in the loaf, there's got to be power in the crumbs that make the loaf. Amen. That's good preaching. Lord, you know what I'll do? That's good preaching. Have a, I, I, if I can survive on a crumb, and by the way, Lord, if you give me a crumb, I'm not even going to take it for myself. I'm going to take it home and give it to my daughter. Amen. The Lord said, this is pretty amazing. And you don't even have the training and the teaching that anybody else does. But see, the Lord's always wanting to share His bread with anyone that'll sit down at the table. Come on, man. Come on, man. I get reading. And the Bible said the Lord prepared a great supper. Can you imagine Him preparing supper? That's got to be some more meal. And he went before he prepared the supper. He got a bunch of numbers, how many's coming. So I'll know how many to prepare for. That's smart. That's good wisdom, right? We're going to have 100, so we need to feed 100, right? 100. One, zero, zero, right? So we know that. So he said, okay. So he prepared the meal. Every minute detail. And then he said, hey, now all of those that said... They were coming, bid them to come in. Yes, sir. The supper is now ready. The table is set. The placards are on the table. We're ready, man. The waiters are ready. The wait staff is ready. The cooking staff is ready. The caterers have brought the food. We are ready for the meal. And he went and one by one they began to make excuse. I know I said I'd come, but. I know I said I'd be there, but. I know it is revival time, but I know I told you that I was going to be there every time the doors were open, but and the Lord said, hey, we prepared a meal. Man, it's got everything you could possibly want. Come and dine. Well, Lord, I'd, I'd really like to, but one's got to go try some oxen that he bought without seeing it. One's some land and one's married. That's what it says. One was married. Well, it seems to indicate that she said, you might have wanted to go, but I ain't going. Split household. And the Bible said he was angry. And he said, I'll tell you what you do. Go into the highways and the hedges and invite anybody that wants to come to the wedding feast, the doors are open. We prepared the best of the best for the best of everybody. They don't want it. We'll give it to anybody, whosoever will. Amen. 
Hey, let him come in. Yes. 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 He said, go into the hedges and the highways and bid the blind and the lame and the deaf and the dumb, all the ones that are the dregs of society. And so the servant went out and he goes, man, I got one mission. I got to fill up the table. And he went out. And when they came back in, they counted and they counted the peeps and they said, Lord, we did what you told us to do, but there's still room at the table. You say, why? He left a seat at the table for you. He didn't leave a seat at the table to get you involved in a conspiracy or conflict. He didn't leave you there to get involved with a bunch of people from Jezebel's table. He said, would you like to come eat with me? I don't know how he's going to do it, but when we sit down at the marriage supper, I'm telling you right now, it is going to feel like it's you and him having dinner, but he's going to be with everybody. He ain't going to be way down there at the end of the table. And you can see him. You're going to feel like he's sitting beside you. Say, I just can't believe that would happen that way. Will you wait till we get there? Amen. And when you punch me, Jesus is going to say, what are you punching me for? Well, I was trying to punch the preacher. Well, why are you punching me? Well, because well, he was right. You're, you're, you're sitting right here. Well, why would you doubt that? Well, I mean, after all, you know, he's the preacher. And what he said? There's still room. I'm going to ask you two questions. We'll close. What are you eating? Who are you eating with? Would you be willing today to say, you know something? Lord, could I take that vacancy? We went to a nice restaurant. I don't make any bones about it. One of them high dollar places. And supposedly the food and the service and all that was like a Huge deal, like you don't want to miss this. It's like primo, you got to be here and so on and so forth. Well, we made an early time to be able to come seated, but guess what? There were actually other people that wanted to eat at the same place, which is a good thing if it's a really special restaurant and nobody else wants to eat there, somebody might not be telling the truth. There's two ways that you can tell things. Number one, if the police eat there, it's safe or half price, one or the other. <laughs> But number two, if you have a hard time getting a reservation, it's usually because the food and the service is outstanding. I'm telling you about a place where the food and the service is beyond anything you can imagine. And you don't have to wait. When your reservation is made, when you show up, you're seated. You're out of fellowship with the Lord, you know what he's saying? Come on. So I sang about it today. She know what I was preaching? I didn't send her my outline. You know what that boy missed? He missed the table at his daddy's house. What? What's the first thing that came to his mind? His servants have plenty of bread to eat. I will arise. And when the daddy said, do you have a reservations? Have you called in early? Do you have early seating? We got a line. We'll see if we can work you in. Come on, no. There had always been a seat available. It was just waiting for him to come Amen. fill it. Can I ask you a question? Would the Lord say about you this morning, your seat is vacant? And you're sorely missed. We miss having fellowship with you. We miss sitting down and talking. We miss sitting down and eating. We miss the intimacy that occurs around the table. 
everything you have down here that we enjoy so much is a knockoff of how great it will be when you get there. But would the Lord say, like Jonathan did, hey, your seat's vacant, David, and we sure miss you at the table. If you're not saved, can I say this to you? There's a seat available. Don't wait till the dining room's closed. You need to come take your place now. But can I say this to you? The majority of you are saved. I don't know who you're eating with. The Lord doesn't care where you've eaten in the past. But He is ready for some of you to get up from Jezebel's table. Or Herodias' table. He is ready for you to get up from Herod's table. He's ready for you to say, you know something? I will arise and go to my father because there's plenty of bread to eat in my father's house. I wonder whether or not you might say, you know something, Lord, I'm not even worthy to sit in the chair. But a meal prepared by you, it must be unbelievable. So I'd be happy if I could just get some crumbs. And would you crawl down under the table this morning, even if he made you feel like a dog when you first ran into him? He said, Lord, you're right, I'm a dog. I messed up again. I did it again, Lord. Could I at least get a crumb? At that moment, you know what he'll do? He'll take you like David took Mephibosheth. And he won't expect you to get to the table on your own. He'll pick you up. He'll carry you and seat you right by him. And he'll put what crippled you before under the table. And he'll cover you with the tablecloth. You know what he'll say? This is my boy Mephibosheth, Amen. the son of my friend Jonathan. Amen. He will eat bread at the king's table Amen. from now on. The Lord. He's my special <coughs> guest. Oh, preacher, it can't. Oh, man. You obviously haven't had a meal in a long time. There ain't no chef like Jesus. Amen. Ain't no pastry chef like him. Amen. Ain't no barbecue grill master like him. That's right. Nobody can cook like he can cook. But you know what he do? He makes one requirement. Come and dine. And you know what you have to be willing to do? Get up out of the slop if you're in it. Get away from Jezebel's tail if your table if you're sitting around it. Get away from the other thing. You say, what am I doing? I am headed back to the house. 